Warning, World Worry Podcast occasionally discusses mature themes and uses colorful language. Welcome to World Weary, a podcast attempting to abduct you for a couple hours. We'll be taking you to strange places and telling you some far out stories while probing each other about the paranormal or fantastic. I'm the American one, Cassiopeia Walker. And I'm the British one, Violet Starr. Before we begin, I want to do like a recap of last week. Mm. But first, first, you've been to a car boot this morning. Yeah. And I kind of want to hear what kind of amazing things and people you beheld at the sacred car boot. But for Americans, real quick. If you don't I'm not going to know what a car boot is. Okay, so we have yard, yard sales. sales and flea markets, mm-hmm. right? So what the British do is they combine those two into a weird, fantastical thing called a car boot sale. And it's usually... We have jumble sale. Yeah, you do have jumble sales. Jumble sales, bric-a-brac sale. Do you have bric-a-brac in America? Yeah, we got bric-a-brac. <laughs> we have flea, flea markets as well. Okay. We've got it all. It all originates here, right? Yeah. What? <laughs> a car boot sale is usually on a Sunday morning, really fucking Yeah, it's like early. a weekend activity. Farmer early yeah. <laughs> in the morning. And everyone sells stuff out of their car's boot or cheap plastic tables. Mm. And it's sort of like a pop-up thing. Some are regular, but they're usually seasonal. Yeah, you get a lot in the summer. But yeah, you can pay a small fee to sell mm. there. Mm-hmm. And how was your experience at the car boot? Uh, just mainly we go for the people watching. <laughs> me and my mum just get entranced listening to other people's conversations <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to explain the joy of going to the car boot without unless you really experience mm. it and you like to look at a weird snapshot of a certain kind of British people that regularly attend car boot There's a, my, one of my things I've always said is that car boot people You'd never see them anywhere else. Like, they don't go to, like, the supermarket. They don't go to, like, Asda or Sainsbury's. You never see them out in, like, normal situations. They only exist at the car booths. They buy everything they need from the car boot. Like, their meat, their, like, sweets and cakes, their bric-a-brac, their creepy old plastic baby dolls. That's horrifying that they sell meat at a car boot. I mean, I was listening to this woman, and I... giggling and I had to get my mum because I was laughing about it so much this morning I was walking around and I could hear this lady behind you know running a little stall of like crappy like dirty baby toys and like creepy old bric-a-brac and um she was on the phone to someone while she was tending her stall and she was saying like she said that to me and I'm not gonna lie I punched her (laughs) no I'm not lying I punched her I did (laughs) Seriously, though, I punched her. And she was just having this conversation, trying to convince someone that she had punched another lady. Ugh. Just, it's just a fascinating, weird social observation thing, the car boot. And you get to buy trinkets. Did you see I they mainly, caught your eyes? I mainly actually go around, I've realised now that as I'm heading towards my 30s, that my collections in life are either very sparkly, tacky, lustreware pieces, Mm. which is like a shiny, pearlescent, like ceramics and china and stuff, which is kind of tacky, and Mm -hmm. anything to do with smoking paraphernalia, old ashtrays, weird old, like, gross old pub ashtrays. (laughs) I've got so many. I've even bought, this is the, the piece de resistance, is a large lustreware clock so a shiny pearlescent <laughs> clock of two crazy 1950s deers with the massive oh eyelashes like two bambies oh. and a built-in ashtray oh my as God. part of your clock <laughs> with your nature scene somewhere for you to like just rest a cigarette oh my gosh this is the thing one of the <clears> when <throat> you had your place in london she had proudly placed this yellow old pub ashtray keeps it pristinely clean Mm -hmm. but like these weird weird ashtrays that you expect to see like they're really vintage and retro it's just you don't expect it yeah and the more like the more rough a brand of 
tobacco <laughs> it is, the better, like, senior service oh, players number six. I used to work like... in a pipe shop as well, so you mm. get, like, these old staples that yeah. you've never heard of in a normal shop. You can only get this stuff yeah. in pipe shops. And the only people that still smoke them are, like, a hundred. Oh, yeah, they're mm. well old mate. <laughs> yeah. I haven't introduced the topic. I okay. sort of gave some clues. We're going to delve into the world of aliens and UFOs, or sometimes called UFOs. Okay. Depending on how hard you press your glasses into your face when you correct people. <laughs> I'm going to call them UFOs because mm-hmm. that's my bag, baby. We're not just talking any old aliens, though, this week. We're talking... About some sexy ass aliens. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to call this episode. I think it's we've been calling it be sexy, sexy aliens, aliens, but I'm not sure if we if that's what we want on our Google search. Yeah, we'll think about it. We'll think about it. We'll ha- maybe we'll have an idea by the end of this episode <laughs> once we've revealed these, these stories to each other. So basically, the alien stories where either the aliens involved are super sexy, yeah. the way they're described or whatever, or some sexy stuff happens in the adventure. AKA alien breeding program. I should be sensitive and call them ab- abductions. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to do a disclaimer at the front, like whether or not these stories are true, the people telling these stories for better or worse mm. or whatever, believe these stories. Mm. They believe these stories. So we're going to try and treat them with as much respect as possible. But for whatever reason, this is how it is, my my people. We need, we're going to give you our honest opinions. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, we've researched these stories I a bit. I full on believe this week. You don't understand the hole I went in, Violet. I went in. <laughs> You're wearing a tinfoil hat right now. So I, I thought you'd never notice. <laughs> I, it's actually in the shape of a beret. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to wear any old tinfoil hat. But I wanted to fashion it up. Yeah. If you're gonna wear a tinfoil hat, Stylish. It's exactly chic, practical, and chic. <laughs> so yeah, sexy aliens. I mean, do you have any pre thoughts before the? Okay, the reason that I think we brainstormed this originally, yeah, in our list of things that we we want to talk about mm-hmm. initially, anyway, on this podcast, um, are that these kind of stories of this nature, mm. these kind of. Uh, alien, they're mainly alien abductions, but there's some, you know, they're either part of a breeding program with the aliens, mm. or there is something of a, a sexual nature yeah. happens to these people in relation to the alien abduction. They would just have been burnt into my mind. They're one of the things I remember the most oh, as yeah. a kid. Like, I was so shocked <laughs> by, the, yes. by the idea that, like, people were, you know, this had gone there. With, with the alien stories. It, it's one of those things that stick out in your mind. When I think about the alien bible I used to read when I was a kid, <laughs> like, it was literally like a bible of like every alien sighting, encounter, report. There were like a whole, there was a whole chapter on these kind of stories. Yeah. And I remember them all very well. <laughs> like I was very surprised and I was quite sceptical about some of it. But horrified by the possibility that oh, yeah. it could be real. Well, I mean, I started out pretty skeptical this week going in as far as just, you know, I have my own ideas before about why these sort of things mm. happen. But we're going to go, I'm going to try and give the best full picture of mm-hmm. my story as I can. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start off with the story story though. Now, if you go on any old normal site. You're mm. not going to get a lot of information about these mm. kind of stories. you got to go to those conspiracy archives. Mm. And you got to double, triple check sources because yeah. certain sites copy yeah. others. Certain places the information's gotten muddled and it's really hard to track down original reports sometimes. Mm. Especially in the case that I'm going to talk about today. I just want to pre-think a bunch of websites that helped me out this week. Conspiracy Archive, Live science and a bit of Wikipedia, but mainly Conspiracy Archive, which seems to be where a lot of people, other sources, are getting their information from. Mm. But also there's a YouTube video with Dr. L- L- I think Dr. Fonte is basically explaining what happened as well. Anyway, we'll get into it. Mm. So are you ready for my story? Yeah, buckled in. I don't know whether you've heard this one before, but here we go. I'm going to be talking about the case of Antonio... V.S. Boas, 
So this is OG. This is like the the classic. This is of our for this topic. This is the, like the famous. And I know I'm gonna get a bunch of stuff wrong. <laughs> I've only got so much time in the week to research because I am working full time. Mm. If I have any inconsistencies or like if I've said something incorrect, make sure to send me an email at worldweirdpodcast at gmail dot com, and maybe we'll do a follow up at some point. But I'm gonna do the best that I can with the time that I had <laughs> to and really go into this. But the information's out there. It just is it, it, with these famous cases, it gets so muddled. Mm. Oh yeah. This is the thing with most And then they throw in other things, like, they, they'll say, mm-hmm. oh, it has to do with this person. Maybe mm-hmm. he stole the idea from this person. But then when you research that person and this person, it starts to get even more muddy. Yeah. So I'm going to try and focus on just... We're just trying to pick things that jump out to us. Mm-hmm. Try and push yeah. together some kind of story. If you're line. really into this stuff, I know you probably know more than me, mm-hmm. but I will be glad to be enlightened. So you go ahead and email us, and I will be happy to read extra information that you've gotten that I didn't manage to obtain. Mm. So here we go. My version. Four years prior to the famous mm. Betty and Barney Hill case, which we'll cover at some point, I'm sure, mm. he is one of the first people to get known for his encounter. One of the strange things about it is this: he's told the story, and then years later it came out kind of thing. You'll see why. In the original report, there were also two other sightings. Antonio Villas Boas, who led a normal life as a young farmer, was farming with his brother and stuff when strange things started to happen. All right, so we're in the 50s. I think 57 is when they quote the case, 1957, Mm -hmm. October 15th. Here's one of the original reports. So a little after 11 p.m. on October 5th, Boas spotted a bright white light in the sky as he opened the window to get some air. Later that night, after sleeping for a while, Boas awoke and looked again to find the same light still there, moving toward him as he looked at it. Frightened, he slammed the shutters, waking his brother, who watched with some astonishment as the bright light played through the shutters a while before leaving. Basically, he lives on his family farm. One thing to note is that in Brazil at the time, there's a lot of poverty. The fact that they have a tractor and things Mm -hmm. like that is of note because yeah. he's not any old farmer. There are farmers yeah, that can afford tractors. Mm. They had several fields and plantations which they farmed at night to beat the heat in the daytime. You're going to hear that over and over whenever you research. Mm-hmm. They farm at night. Awesome. Good idea. On the 14th, around 9 to 10 p.m., Boas again with his brother were out tilling the fields when they both witnessed an extremely bright light over 300 feet above their heads. So not so far that you can't Mm. sort of figure out what it is or at least see that it's not normal Boas leaving his brother behind set out to investigate as it got closer he darted away at tremendous speed to the opposite end of the field he approached it again and again it darted away back to where it had started from this maneuver was repeated no less than 20 times at last discouraged Boas returned to his brother Boas said the light kept still for a few moments longer in the distance, and now and again it seemed to throw forth rays in all directions, Mm -hmm. so it's doing weird shit. Then it suddenly disappeared as if it had been turned off. And Boas says, I'm not sure if this is what actually happened, for I cannot remember if I kept looking in the same direction all the time. Maybe for a few seconds I glanced elsewhere, so it may have lifted up and disappeared before I had the time to look back again. Alright, so the next night he worked in the fields alone, and when he was at the same spot he and his brother had witnessed Mm. the light the night before. This is when the famous encounter Mm. occurs. He saw a reddish light in the sky. He's out there farming, tilling away, he's seen some weird shit. All of a sudden, a reddish light is in the sky. It starts to zoom toward him at at a really fast rate. And this is a quote from Boss. So quickly... That it was on top of me before I could make up my mind what to do about it. About 160 feet above his head, it stopped, and the light was so intense that he couldn't see his tractor's headlights through it at 1 a.m. He said it looked like a large, elongated egg with several technical features about it. The original sketch sort of looks, they compare it to Sputnik. Mm. It's got, like, these legs coming out of it and stuff. Three legs extended from it. And as it settled to land, he ran to his tractor in terror. When he reached it, he got into the tractor, started to try and get away with it, and the tractor's engine died, and the lights turned off. 
he got out of the other side of the tractor and started running toward the house when his arm was grabbed. Ugh. It was grabbed by a small figure. It only reached to his shoulder, and it was wearing strange clothes. And I'll describe the clothes okay. to you in just a minute in great detail. And there were other s- small figures around him. And basically there was a scuffle, and he gets taken onto this ship. Mm. I'm going to back it up real quick, because when he's first asked about this story, he's interrogated for hours. So basically... Mm. They did an article about aliens, an article about aliens came out, and then they were asking for stories, and he sent in his story by mail, and then these people came in to investigate, this journalist and his friend, came down to investigate. They interrogated him for loads of time, and this is how he describes them. All of them wore a very tight-fitting siren suit made of soft, thick, unevenly striped gray material. The garment reached right up to their necks where it was joined to a kind of helmet made of another gray material that looked stiffer and was strengthened back at nose level. Their helmets hide everything except their eyes, which were protected by two round glasses like the lenses in ordinary glasses. Through them, the men looked at him, and their eyes seemed to be much smaller than the average human eye, Mm -hmm. like really beady, and he thought it may have been the effect of the lenses, All of them had light-colored eyes that looked blue, but he couldn't Mm -hmm. quite tell. Above their eyes, the helmet looked so tall that they corresponded to what double the size of a normal head should be. So they've got these weird, beady little eyes and giant heads. Uh, Helmets, at Mm -hmm. least. We don't know what's in there. Right on top, from the middle of their heads, there sprouted three round silvery metal tubes, which were a little narrower than a common garden hose. He couldn't tell whether they were made of rubber or a metal material. They were fitted into their clothes, so it's just just, the tubes were placed one in the middle and one on each side, and they were smooth and bent backward and downward toward the back, and they fitted in. He didn't know how they, they did that, but one went down to the center where the backbone is, and the other two on each side fitted under the shoulders at about four inches from the armpits nearly at the sides where the back begins. He didn't notice anything at all, no kind of lumps or whatever to show where they were attached, nor any contrivance hidden under their clothes. So it's just like this weird suit. There's a quote from um, one of these sites where it's interesting to note the similarities between Boas' descriptions of the creature's clothing and that of fairies. The unevenly striped uniforms sound sort of like the party-colored clothing design of an elf okay. in traditional blah blah blah. Mm. And even with bent hoses sticking out of the head like tassels. This is a quote from a <laughs> random su- website that was trying mm. to make a fairy correlation. I definitely wanted to add it. They're yeah, like, yeah. it could be fairies. <laughs> <laughs> He's being taken into the ship by these people wearing these horrible suits. He resists as best he can, but he's found himself being pulled up flexible metallic rolling ladder into a hatchway, which closed behind them so neatly that no seam was visible to the naked eye. Now he found himself into a small square room, no furnishings, brightly lit, the same as broad daylight, by recessed square lights in the smooth metallic walls. Weird lights everywhere. Mm -hmm. Suddenly an opening appears from the seamless wall. Visible was an oddly shaped table that stood at one side of the room, surrounded by several backless swivel chairs, something like bar stools. Okay. They were all made of the same white material. The table, as well as the stools, were one-legged, narrowing toward the floor. Crazy. Yeah, where they were either fixed, such as the table, to it, or linked to a movable ring held by three hinges jutting out on each side, so that if you're sitting on them, they can turn in any direction. What do we think about alien design and alien stuff is that just like a hologram or something to make the human feel comfortable yeah i wonder do aliens really have like a door and a ladder and like a 50s 60s freaking cute mm-hmm. breakfast bar well, that'll inside can't, that'll there. come up later like, oh so futuristic it's got one freaking <laughs> leg bar stool well i i like your idea that maybe it's like it's their interpretation yeah. of furniture yeah why is it that aliens always pick postmodern really like human uh planet earth furniture design and yeah, why interior they design like, that was like kind of futuristic why doesn't something just come out of the wall and just grasp you yeah in a gel like why way? is it even yeah exactly and then you're just in a gel the only something. reason if aliens really did have a spaceship that looked like that my only answer is that it's designed 
to make the human feel at ease. Yeah. Well, well, or they're, they're, been, talk or they're barely above us in mm-hmm. evolution and they've yeah. just gotten to the point of space travel and are messing around. And like tacky, like, like an evil Star Trek race. white leather breakfast bar stool. Yeah. <laughs> He's in this creepy room. They're all grabbing at him and stuff. They've got these stools. He's being taken in there. While they're holding him in place, they're speaking a weird language. The quote is, no resemblance whatsoever to human speech. I can think of no attempt to describe those sounds, so different were they from anything I had ever heard before. Those sounds still make me shiver when I think of them. It isn't even possible for me to reproduce them. My vocal organs aren't made for it. He compares them to animal grunts. Some people compare him barking, some longer, others shorter, sometimes contain several different sounds at the same time, and at other times ending in a tremor. All these alien movies we watch. Yeah, like, like, they're like... <laughs> <laughs> so, curiously, these creatures begin to undress him. Mm. My nightmare. <laughs> so you don't need to see this. I'm working on my abs. <laughs> Despite his constant opposition, so he is fighting the whole time, Mm -hmm. they obviously couldn't understand me, but they stopped and stared at me as if trying to make me understand that they were being polite. Besides, though they had to employ force, they never at any time hurt me badly. They did not tear my clothes, with the exception of my shirt, perhaps. When he was naked, they started to rub him all over with a clear, odorless liquid. Some articles describe it as like a weird gel. And then he was prompted into another room with red inscriptions over the door. Mm -hmm. He said it's like scribbles of kind entirely unknown to us. Soon, two of the figures joined him carrying apparatuses with which they took some blood from his chin. They left small scars that were later noticed by doctors at a hospital, maybe. I'm not sure. There's a theory that maybe they were trying to get capillary blood from his cheeks or something. I don't know how it works. I'm not a doctor. He describes the tube somewhere. Boa says he was left alone for about an hour and made himself comfortable on a large, featureless, foam, rubber-like gray bed or couch in the middle of the room with no legs. Okay, so a futuristic, pleather couch. Mm. From holes in the wall, from about the height of his head, came tufts of gray smoke that quickly dissolved. At first he felt nauseated, as though he was being suffocated. Then he rushed to one corner of the room, vomited, and after that his breathing was easier. A little while later, a door opened, and in walked a naked woman. Okay, so they got him naked, got him on the white pleather couch. Oh, and he's all weird, slathered in like, weird... Like, 50s, 60s, futuristic gel. spaceship room. Mm. Covered in lubricant. And then they gas you to make you relax. Velas Boas, so, <laughs> speculated that the clear liquid was an aphrodisiac. To my mind, the logic of the story, uh, this is someone else's quote, suggests that it was a germicide of some kind. So this depends on what you want to believe. Mm. But Boas himself thinks that it was an aphrodisiac. Did they wash him down at some point before they, when they got his clothes off, or did they just go straight for the gel? I think they just I was taking, like, I mean, you know how, like, uh, like import laws and stuff yeah. are like you can't be bringing seeds or like mud from other countries mm. you wouldn't want to pick up this like foreign creature from another planet well, into your spaceship I would be like hosing them down like well, they're in like suits. hazmat suit so it's weird I have no mm. idea she came in slowly unhurriedly perhaps a little amused at the amazement she saw on my face I stared open mouthed She was beautiful, though of a different type of beauty compared with the women I have known. Her hair was blonde, nearly white, like hair dyed in peroxide. It was smooth and not very thick, with a part in the center. And she had big blue eyes, rather long, longer than round, for they slanted outward like those pencil-drawn girls made to look like Arabian princesses, that look as if they were slit, except that they were more natural, there was no makeup. Her nose was straight, not pointed, not turned up, nor too big. Hmm. The contour of her face was different, though, because she had very high, prominent cheekbones that made her face narrowed to a peak. And so her chin looked like it was just a point It was just right. a point in her face, so it all just goes hmm. choo, like a triangle. It gave the lower part of her face a very pointed look. Her lips were very thin, nearly invisible. Her ears, which I only saw later, were small and did not seem different from ordinary ears. Her high cheekbones gave one the impression that there was a broken bone somewhere underneath. 
but as I discovered later, they were soft and fleshy to the touch, so they did not seem to be made of bone. Her body was much more beautiful than any I had ever seen before. It was slim, and her breasts stood up high and well separated. <laughs> her waistline was thin, her belly flat. Her hips well developed and her thighs were large. Right, so she was like way She's out thick. of the league. <laughs> her feet were small, her hands long and narrow. Her fingers and nails were normal. She was much shorter than I. Her head only reached to my shoulder. They guessed she was about four feet. Her skin this, was. This guy's listing his like <laughs> fantasy woman, like super beautiful, like uniquely giant beautiful, tics, big, big boobs, big, big legs, legs, tiny waist, thick thighs. She was full of freckles on her arms. He didn't notice any perfume except for a natural female odor. Mm-hmm. And another thing he noticed was the hair in her armpits was bright red, nearly nearly the color of blood. A later recounting of Boas' story included the mention that her pubic hair was also bright red, which may have been omitted from the original publication because of the time, the sexual yeah. wars of the time. Details of his encounter, which followed, were not published either, but apparently he did discuss them, albeit with some embarrassment, when relating to his story to Dr. Fontes and Mr. Martins, the journalist. Boas recounts that the woman came toward him in silence as if she wanted something from him. She pressed herself to him, and he understood what her purpose was. I began to get excited. I ended up forgetting everything and held the woman close to me, corresponding to her favors with greater ones of my own. That's a statement. (laughs) Apparently, they had two sexual encounters and performed a variety of acts together for about an hour, after which the woman pulled away to leave. His quote is, All they wanted was a good stallion to improve their stock. Boas would say. He said that he enjoyed the encounter, even if the woman refused to kiss. I've heard other stories that differ from that, mm-hmm. but yeah. I'm taking this one. Yeah. He also said that the woman preferred to bite his chin while making sounds that sounded animalistic. She never spoke. When they were finished, one of the other creatures entered and called out to the woman. But before leaving, she pointed to her belly and smiled best she could with her thin, weird <sighs> lips and pointed to the sky okay. southward, I guess, mm-hmm. if you're interested. Then she went away. He interpreted the sign to meaning that she intended to return and take me with her. (laughs) He seemed to be concerned or even afraid about the last, for he took the meaning quite seriously and wasn't sure if he was anxious to leave his surroundings or his family. The creature returned Boas's clothes after they took the, the woman away. He was led back to the room with the stools and table where they sat and communicated around him in their strange way, ignoring him. He felt calm, for he knew no harm would come to him, and now he had a chance to take stock of all the surroundings so he tried to remember all he could he noticed that the walls were smooth metal and hard no windows there was a box with a glass top that looked like an alarm clock and he attempted to take it and conceal it but noticing this one of the crew seized it instantly and shoved him back so he described this clock as having one hand and several marks that correspond to the three six nine and twelve of an ordinary clock although time had passed the hand did not move And so he figured it wasn't a clock. Mm. The symbolism in this remark is clear. Somebody else thinks. Mm. This is the person with the fairy fairy theories again. Okay. We are reminded of fairy tales of the country where time does not pass. (laughs) And that great poet who had in his room a huge white clock without hands bearing the word is later than you think. Anyway. That guy really believes that those are fairies. The creatures continued to lead him through the ship, pointing out various interesting features, which he described at great length with a remarkable amount of detail. I wish I could see this stuff, because um, he keeps talking about how much detail, but it's hard to find the actual details. So after the tour, they gesture him down the ladder, then point to the themselves, and then to the ground, and then in a southerly direction in the sky, uh, the same direction the woman pointed. So Boas was signaled to step back, and the ladder retracted, The ship rose. The tripod landing struts retracted once again, very smoothly, and through this opening, and stopped a little over a hundred feet above his head, growing brighter, and the buzz formed by the dislocation of air grew louder, and the revolving saucer began to rotate at a terrific speed, while the light turned to many shades of color, finally settling on a bright red. As this happened, the machine abruptly changed direction by turning unexpectedly and producing a larger noise, a kind of shock. And when this was over, the airship darted away like a bullet southward, holding askew at a heavy speed. It disappeared from sight in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Mr. Martin and the Dr. Fontes, you know, after hearing this, 
Mm. They discuss it with themselves, and they're like, this man's a crazy man. He cannot be believed. This story is crazy. And they go to him and tell him that the report can't be published. He's 23 years old. He's like, oh, what's up? You know. And they told him, it's too fantastic, and most people will believe you are lying. And his answer was, well, if you think it's best, I'm just going to go away from my town, and I'm not going to talk to anyone about it anymore. And he did just that. Mm. The report was not printed, and they, what they did is him and the doctor gave him a list of seven newspapers that would probably publish his story if he told them, mm. and he never went to any of them. Mm. Um, there's some rumors he went to Rio to see a doctor and all this stuff, but uh, he did send some letters back and forth to the guys who interviewed him, sometimes troubled with, you know, asking about medicines and stuff mm. like that. But then once he was married, he sent them a letter like, thank goodness the story didn't come out because I'm a lawyer now, and I'm married. And I think my wife would be, like, really pissed off and sort of a bit jealous about the attention. Mm. She's the main lady in my life now. Mm-hmm. You know, very cheeky, like, goodbye, don't publish yeah. a story like yeah. Unfortunately for him, seven years later, the story was published. So he had been living his life, mm. normal life with his lady. And all of a sudden, the story mm. becomes published. But he doesn't go. There are no further interviews with him. They go back. They, those two dudes did mm. go back to him years mm. later. And they asked him about the story again, and he was like, oh, I forgot, like, most of it. And he's like, okay, so I remember this happening and this happening. There were no inconsistencies in the retelling. It was just clear he had forgotten Mm. specific details as you do when you get older. But he didn't change the story whatsoever. And the only recorded account at that point was the 12 pages they'd written in the original time. It's just a bit of a fascinating Mm, fact there. So he had four children, he was a lawyer, and... um, at 56, he died in 1991 or two, depending on what you read, having not changed his story and having not sought out fortune mm. for it either. He mm. lived his life as a lawyer, yeah, chilled out. So I got another article from Live Science called The Surprising Origin of Alien Abduction Stories, which focuses on a bunch of different mm. stories. They've done a brilliant job, but I'm just going to take a bit of what they've said here and quote it. Martins was doing a lot of the original journalist that interviewed him mm. with the doctor he was doing a lot of alien stories. It was mm. his kind of thing. He he wrote asking people to send these stories in. And he selected one of these people from Minas with whom he exchanged several mm. letters before, you know. And the next year he came down. Uh, he paid for him to come up to Rio de Janeiro mm. where he was examined and stuff. He happened to get abducted a day after <laughs> reading Martin's article. So they send a detailed report about the Boas case to the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, but Gonzalez explained they decided it's too fantastic mm. to publish, blah, blah, blah. But the so- story circulated between the, quote, experts, he wrote. So eventually the story gets out. Mm. So in typical UFO fanatic fashion... The story does get passed out, but it seems ridiculous, and then eventually it does get published. This guy, Bueller, visits him, and then he republishes the report on Boas' case in English, and an account aligned with uh, George Adamski suddenly comes into the picture. He's another famous UFO dude with his descriptions of aliens, so they think it's correlated, but I'm not sure. But in 1965, an international journal called The Flying Saucer Review reproduced his report, Worldwide, that is where they think Boas gets his ideas mm. from. Is these original reports and all the all the things that happened to him? They believe, whether real or imagined. If you read Billis Boas' account, you may notice the advanced aliens nonetheless use rope ladders, something you had contention with, mm. like immediately. And again, it looks remarkably like drawings of Sputnik One, and it was definitely the talk of the time in 1957. When his story was, mm. you know, when he when, when that happened to happened, him, yeah. there was, of course, the fact that the young farmer had just. And I'm sorry, but that argument's very thin, considering alien believers can just say, "Well, wouldn't it interest aliens if we're suddenly about to like be able to do space travel and space exploration?" Anyway, he was a creative person. He was smart. Obviously, he became a lawyer. So usually, the buzzword around this is, "Oh, he's just a farmer in poor Brazil." You know, he wouldn't make this story up, especially since he didn't get money from it. But he wasn't just a poor farmer. His family had a tractor. Mm. He became a lawyer. So he scraped some pennies together Mm. to be Mm. able to, you know, they had several fields and plantations. It wasn't just a poor one field farmer. So there's so many sides of this story as far as what you can totally be skeptic on it. Which I've gone back and forth this whole week mm. on whether I believe it or not. But I think I do. <laughs> but yeah, that's the story of Antonio 
this was <laughs> these are the things that jump out at me with these stories because there's going to be a lot of recurring themes in today's episode because a lot of these stories share some of the same kind of concepts and there's similar stuff going on <sighs> alien furniture why do aliens always have to look like kind of humanoids like us why are they bipedal because otherwise um, it's a mushroom trip yeah Otherwise, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Have you ever Why do they be... have to have doors? Why do they have to be gendered? This is What's that movie that came out recently where the aliens were like weird in a gaseous place and they, they it's a contact story kind of thing where they come and okay. she has to translate. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing because it actually feels like mm. a fresh take on what aliens would mm. be like. They're like weird tentacle monsters in a gaseous zone and their only way of communicating is these weird complex things mm. that mathematicians have to figure out. Ooh. And that's how, because their language is through time. They have a time like I've just okay. ruined the whole film for you. <laughs> but this is really cool. Why, so why, why, why wouldn't if these aliens yeah. are real, why do they look like freaking humans? I mean, humans have been, we are specific. And not only humans. Planet. And it all goes back to this thing for me. And it's the Kim like, Kardashian aliens. Yeah, and I always question it, is why is it that humans are always the special ones? Why isn't it that the aliens are coming here and abducting badgers and yeah. koalas. They stole my koalas. And, you know, like, the badgers are actually all sat in their den being like, oh yeah, we're the special ones. Aliens have been building these pyramids well, I mean, dedicated they do to weird the badgers. We are a, a, we're an alien colony placed on the planet. Why is it that all humans, we're always the centre of the world. The aliens clearly are only interested in us. We are descended from aliens, etc, etc. Why is it that we're always the special ones? Well, like, I think it's because why not like, badgers? we're at this place where we have technology, so it's easy to to ego ourselves up and be like, of course aliens are going to be interested in us. Look at all the great things mm. we can do. Mm. But we don't have our shit together. We're slowly destroying the planet, so we're not that great. I can see the argument of... And why are aliens interested in breeding with us in these breeding programs and whatnot? I've got theories... This is the thing, like, all the theories are usually like, oh, their planet or species can do all these amazing things, but they got, like, womb but rash. This is the deal, it's like, look, like, okay, unless it's the scenario where we are a, an alien colony. They're trying to integrate here. and take over, Violet, yeah. they need to We're breed. so special, we didn't evolve from tree shrews like everything else on this planet. We got placed here, because yeah. we're special, by the aliens. If it's not that story, why do the aliens want to breed with us? And how are we somehow capable to breed with something that's from another planet? Can't mate with other animals on this on the same planet that we are like related to. They're highly to. advanced species, Violet. They know how to make it work. That's why they used to. Well, gel. why not pick badgers? Why aren't they making alien badger hybrids? Why is it us? Because we're so special and intelligent. Mm. That's why. Anyway, we've got a lot more of this to get through. We have got, there's a lot of recurring stuff. We've got a lot of mm. issues to, to pick our way through. Okay, and we're ready mm. <laughs> for a story which is pretty interesting. Okay. It's very extraordinary. Um, this is a story of David Huggins. <laughs> I listened to a lot of interviews. I read a lot of interviews and articles about this person and the experiences that he has had yeah. throughout his lifetime. The only thing I think I need to say is that when I listen to the interviews, he's quite incoherent. Okay. This was a real jumble to kind of make sense of. He's an interesting person and he has a strange concept, I think, of like time and yeah. organisation. So his recollections are very muddled. Things cross wires a lot, and it's quite difficult to like get this into like a, a story that makes sense. Yeah. So you're gonna have to forgive that there are a lot of just I'm just gonna be throwing out some just weird sentences in this <laughs> where you're just like, where did that come from? Why is he doing that? Why does that have any meaning to the story? There's a lot of moments like that. And I've tried to get it to make sense. Yeah, you're gonna have to, to bear with me on that. I can't wait. Okay, let's, so let's do this. So, it's mm -hmm. just, can can I just start out by telling you something about Pleiadians? Okay. I don't know if this is about Pleiadians, but there's something I read about Pleiadians this week while I was researching in general for funsies. You know they shit through their skin? What's a Pleiadian? 
So a Pleiadians, they like really Valhalla sort of type Nordic aliens. Oh, okay, from the Pleiades. okay, okay. And they're like, we won't get them this episode, but they go in the sexy alien realm because okay. they're like, you know, that Nordic beauty kind of thing, and they're just better than us. Mm. But if you read about them, they don't shit. So that's like very much like oh aren't they a god? Because if you oh, yeah. anytime there's like when aren't when, they always the perfect woman? They yeah. don't fart. They there's don't. always that story where someone's gone over to a new place and the yeah. the local peoples once they find out they shit and see that smell their shit they're like mm. oh you're not a god yeah this is bullshit. Mm. So the Nordics they, these Pleiadians don't shit but but they do. Because I read, and it, they ex- excrete through their skin. Gross. Anyway, sorry. Wow, you need a lot of perfume. Sorry, I, this is such a sidebar. That's why but... these Pleiadians are coming over here. They're getting the wet wipes, they're getting the perfumes, they're getting yeah. the, like, toilet the I just, feel, I just feel like maybe people are going to be upset if there are no Pleiadians this episode, so there's your Pleiadian fun fact. We'll, we'll get, get to the them Pleiadians next. another time. Next time. We've, when you scratch the surface on this topic... There's so many sexy aliens. There are so many. There's so, so many stories you could spend a lifetime talking about this particular niche section of alien uh, encounters. Section? <laughs> encounters of the uh, romantic kind. Oh. Not always romantic. No, like, I feel like Antonio definitely was ashamed of his. Yeah. So, here we go. David Huggins. An excellent surname. Mm. Uh, <laughs> David Huggins, he's born in the 1940s, so this is just briefly you need to know about about him. He studied art, he's a painter, and a, I think a long-time resident of New York. Okay. A Huggins! Okay, so let's go to 1987. A 43-year-old David Huggins <laughs> is struggling with insomnia. Oh no. So he stays up late into the night listening to the radio. Nowadays we listen to like podcasts or whatever. Yeah. Read a book. He was listening to the radio. One night while listening, he hears about a new book called Intruders, written by Bud Hopkins, who's, you know, now if you're into your UFOs, he's quite famous. He was an artist and a sort of UFO researcher. And he basically compiled a collection of investigations or accounts of alien abductions. Okay. So Intruders was like the the classic alien abduction bible in a way, like here Let are all of these stories. Let me show you my life's work. <laughs> <laughs> and so David hears about this on the radio and he suddenly feels compelled to get a hold of this book. So he goes out, tries to locate it in the bookshop, but none of the local bookstores have the book. He almost gives up when he encounters a strange woman in a bookshop who seems to know, without being asked, exactly which book he needs. Mm. And she immediately gives him a copy and he takes it home and he starts to read it. So David's reading this book. He eventually hits a chapter, like seven, chapter seven or chapter eight in the book, that describes accounts or an account of a man who has had encounters of the sexual kind <laughs> with a female alien. Ooh. Mm. Oh yeah, those aliens only come in male or female, just like us. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, reading this particular alien abductee's account triggers a surge of extraordinary memories and images from David's own past. They flood back to him. It was like a fog had lifted. And David's like, oh my god, this happened to me too. So here are the recollections that come back to David. So he's read this chapter on a, a sexy alien encounters, and he's realised it's story. happened to him. Okay, so, like I said, David's born in the mid-40s. He grows up on a farm in rural Georgia, USA. It's always a farm. Always what what else was there back then in Georgia? I suppose. <laughs> His home life was somewhat troubled. Um, it's kind of hard to pin down exactly what was going on, but I think his family are quite religious, which was probably very common at the time in that place. Um, he sort of didn't like go, being forced to go to this particular church. But what really seems to have disturbed David's childhood are the encounters that he begins to have with strange beings and creatures 
So starting in the early 50s. Oh, wow. Mm. So how old is he maybe? Like... So let's go. 1951. Okay. David's about eight years old. Oh, no. He's out on the family farm, like mucking around somewhere. He's behind a barn. David stops at a tree and he starts digging at a root underneath it. And as he digs at the root, all of a sudden he hears a voice say, David, behind you. Oh, no. He turns around to oh, see no. a small, hairy humanoid no. being that at first he could only interpret as a monkey-looking creature moving out of a wooded area and coming straight towards no, him. No, 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 run! He notices that this little hairy guy has unusual eyes. So when David looks into them, he said it was like looking at himself through the creature's eyes. Oh, it felt as if he was inside the creature's body looking out. Suddenly, David snaps out of it, and he starts yelling and screaming, freaking out. He scrambles back to the barn, where he finally turns around to check behind him, and he sees the little hairy guy travelling back into the woods from where it came. Oh, I'm getting creepy shivers. David runs back to his house and tells his mum what had happened, and that he'd seen this monkey-like being with crazy eyes. And his mama says... There is no monkeys in Georgia except for in the zoo. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're making it up, you're imagining things, son. His family does not believe him, so David goes back outside and he goes back to the barn to investigate and try and make sense of, of what he saw. He looks back at these woods where he'd seen the creature and sure enough, he sees the little hairy guy no. walking out from behind the tree line. Quite sensibly, David runs away he goes and he hides in his house. Bring your So mom. it's like, you know, your mum's just told you you're imagining stuff or making up stories and you kind of second guess yourself and go back out there. Yeah, and then get you rid of the fear. see it again. You get rid of the fear, don't you? You're yeah. like, okay, I'll, I, maybe I did just... So David goes to bed that night. No, how? He's sharing a bedroom with his siblings and from his bed oh, he can goodness. see out of a window. Oh, God, no. And he can see this big pear tree outside on the property. As he's looking at the tree, he realises he can see this owl-like creature with large glowing eyes, like, sat up in the tree looking at him. Oh, no. Then he falls asleep. Oh, that's a, it's always an owl. But he recalls that that night, he was aware that small alien beings, which he now identifies as like three to four foot tall greys, like classic little grey alien, look it up, that these little aliens came into the bedroom, they take him out of bed, and they take him outside without waking any of his other siblings. And that's all he can remember. And when he wakes the next day, he'd forgotten everything that happened with these yeah. strange creatures. So that's like this earliest memory that comes back to David. Basically a memory of being abducted. Yeah. And it happens several more times in a similar fashion whilst David's around the age of eight or nine. So like on one occasion he's out on the farm when he sees this terrifying looking head of a creature oh. with glowing eyes slowly emerge from behind a bush. He freaks out. David falls to the ground and like holds himself in the fetal position. He's so scared. And as he lies there, he again becomes aware that these little grey aliens are, like, standing all around him. Oh. And then that, that's the end of the memory. He also used to go out looking for arrowheads in fields yeah. as a youngster. Um, Samesies. And one time that he was doing this, he saw an alien spaceship in the sky. Freaked out, he ran back to the house. And as he approached his house, he noticed... So this, I think this is, like, a raised American house, you know, like... Not on stilts, but you know what yeah. I mean? Like, built on, like, raised up from the ground. So it's like Swampy space swamps. for, like, raccoons and stuff. Oh, and, like, yeah, right yeah. Oh, yeah, house. yeah. So as he approaches the house, he's looking, like, underneath the house, and he sees... Crawl space. Yeah, like, a crawl spaces. He sees these aliens' legs. Oh, no, but And the, no. the alien beings are hi hiding underneath his no, house. this is horrible. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't remember this bit. So David moves home at 12, I think still in somewhere in Georgia, and he has a few more experiences with the aliens, but he doesn't recall them so well. They're much vaguer memories. He also learns to keep his experiences to himself. 
because his parents have basically started punishing him with whippings oh, wow. when he comes and tells them about his encounters with these beings. Oh, God. Yeah, that'll do it. So now we jump to 1961. He's 17 years old. And this is when David's encounters with the extraterrestrials are about to take a strange turn. Oh, gosh. How old is he? 17. Oh, no. On a hot summer's day, David goes to meet some friends at the local lake. He's walking through some woods near his home on his way to the lake when an alien appears sitting underneath a tree. He describes the alien as a female. She has pale skin, a thin nose, thin mouth, large almond-shaped eyes, a dark-coloured cloak, and black hair that looks like a wig. She appears to have the anatomy of a human woman from the neck down, but her head basically looks like a grey alien. Ugh. David says now that this alien may be a human-alien hybrid herself, which is why she's got a yeah. human body. So this alien, underneath the tree, in David's words, seduces him. Okay. David suddenly becomes very excited. The alien stands up and moves towards him. He becomes entranced by her eyes. He quickly undresses and lays down on the ground. Okay. And the alien and him have an adult encounter. Okay. <laughs> an adult encounter. <laughs> it's all over very quickly. Yeah. Well, 17. I mean, give me David credit. <laughs> describes it as a somewhat painful experience, but ecstatic and euphoric at the same time. Immediately following the encounter... He passes out. He wakes up well, a short time right? later, <laughs> uh, half dressed, with no memory of what had happened, and so he rushes off to the lake and he goes swimming with his friends. He forgets this entire incident until 1987, when you know he's read this chapter oh, and all the memories come back to him, and he vividly remembers this encounter and realizes that he had in fact lost his virginity to an alien. <gasps> That alien, that particular alien, would eventually become known to David as Crescent. She's a female alien, apparently, maybe a alien-human hybrid, and the two of them continue to have <clears throat> encounters <laughs> throughout the rest of his adult life. He describes it almost like a love affair. Oh, wow. Or like a secret woman that was always oh, in his life. <laughs> Through these abductions and encounters, David becomes familiar with this alien, with Crescent. Why does your dick smell like that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he said that Crescent becomes like a girlfriend in a way. But the problem is, he forgets about each encounter immediately after they happen. Yeah. So like, I think from listening to all these interviews with David, I think the deal is that when he is during an encounter, when he is with the aliens, mm. he can access all of his memories about the aliens. Oh, yeah. So yeah. then he remembers that he's been abducted, you know, yeah. 200 times up until now. That they touch on that in the fourth kind, the yeah. film with Mila Jovovich. And then when he's, when it's normal life, when he's not with the aliens, he doesn't have access to those memories. Yeah. He's, he's like forgetting every time. Yeah. Oh, after you know an abduction happens and then he can only remember these things when he's with the aliens in his next encounter again during his late teens david's asleep in bed one night when he suddenly opens his eyes and sees the little hairy guy oh no now no. the little hairy guy apparently kind of looks like a mini sasquatch okay but with these golden almost blinding glowing eyes so this little hairy dude is stood by his bed the little hairy guy says, come outside, David. Ugh. So David gets dressed trigger. and goes outside and he follows the little hairy guy into the woods. There, they enter a large glowing egg with a door on it. And inside, David is met by a strange cast of alien beings. <laughs> Here we go, here's my sitcom. He gets subjected to a medical exam with these little grey aliens. And then maybe also an encounter of a certain mm. kind with Crescent, the female alien. Um, he <laughs> the, also the notices... The female alien. There's all you ever want. Yeah, he also notices a tall insectoid alien that looks like a 
huge praying mantis, okay. who's sort of the boss that's in, in charge of things. <laughs> Give me those photocopies <laughs> right now! <laughs> he also met aliens that look somewhat human, like weird hybrids that had gone wrong. They had like weird hair, or one of them had like growths, or what looked like lumps, or like knobs of bone on the backs of their oh. heads. And David thinks there's some kind of hierarchy, you know, with the the giant insect aliens at the top, okay. and then the little hairy alien at the bottom of the <laughs> of the class system. He does a shit work. And like, wake up, David. Exactly. Even these like female aliens seem to have to consult the like insect praying mantis oh, okay. alien a lot. Like they have to ask its permission for stuff. To be honest, these aliens, their life sounds pretty lame. Basically, yeah. like that's come David. On. I would thought I they would be more advanced. <laughs> so once David finishes school so as I said before he had you know a bit of a troubled home life which kind of propels him to like strive he goes to New York in the 60s to study art and he takes painting classes you know he enjoys art he finds painting to be very therapeutic he gets an apartment and he works these part time jobs like in a hardware store and an art gallery however It's not all rosy. It's not totally getting a fresh start because the aliens follow David to the big city. Oh no! David recalls... Aliens in the big city coming to you. (laughs) In the big apple. (laughs) David recalls something like a tracker being implanted in his nostril. And he suspects that's how the aliens knew where to find him. Oh no. The aliens appear to be monitoring him. He has a lot of weird encounters with them during his day-to-day life. On one occasion, two alien beings in disguises visit him in the hardware shop. <laughs> you just see these weird-ass aliens in a wig. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking they might be customers, David asks if he can help them. But the aliens ignore him, stare at him until he's creeped out, and then silently leave the hardware store. Oh my God. Just fucking with him at this point, right? <laughs> you suck, man. To be honest, some of these kind of encounters do honestly make me question possible mental health issues or a certain Mm -hmm. kind of wiring that David Huggins has that he sees certain patterns in things that we might interpret very differently or that he sees connections between things and explanations for certain coincidences or strange encounters that we might interpret or differently or there's a band of really lame but quirky aliens all hanging out together using earth as like a fun box like here we go all the aliens do just either pick on people with a certain kind of wiring or That's mental what health issue do. that makes you appear crazy to everyone else and no yeah. one believe your alien story. That's maybe they do it on purpose. Maybe they swirling or something? Yeah, maybe yes. they give you some medicine which makes you kind of seem loopy to the rest of us so yeah. that we'll never believe that you got stolen by aliens. Yeah, who knows? Anyway, so the aliens are monitoring. On another occasion, David hitchhikes home across the city a large black car stops and a strange woman that resembles Crescent, the female oh, yeah. alien, <laughs> insists on driving David back to his apartment. What he finds weird about this is that as he exits the car and walks up to his apartment building, the alien has stopped to observe him, maybe take a note of where he lives. Because oh, that nostril tracking device <laughs> apparently only... <laughs> It's 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 only galactic range. Yeah, so you can only tell that he's in New York City, but yeah. you can't pin down where. So that's why they had to go... They didn't have Google back then. That's why they had to go monitor him and try and find out where he lives. Mm. In the old-fashioned way. In another incident, David buys some flowers, places them on a bookshelf in his apartment, and goes to bed. Now, David feels that, he, for some reason, he sort of half-bought this bouquet of flowers with a knowledge somewhere in his mind that he wanted to give them to his alien girlfriend but that he wasn't sure if that was real or not yeah and so he thought well if it is if my alien girlfriend isn't real and i am just crazy then i'll just paint these flowers and that's how i'll make use of them yeah so apparently this is why he just goes out and buys a random bouquet of flowers putting them on a bookshelf when he wakes up the flowers are missing 
and he has a strong feeling that the culprit was Crescent, the female alien. Came and or took when the he remembered everything, he has conscious memories yeah. of everything. Maybe here's the thing that gets me logically in this relationship or whatever, and you remember all this stuff. Maybe they suppress your actual memories so you only know them, or maybe you're conditioned mm. at this mm. point, but would you be immediately horrified and like smash the flowers so you knew something was up? Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, mm. I don't know. Maybe there's a million explanations, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so during this period, he also had lots of weird dreams about the aliens. He would often wake in the morning hearing voices or the words, We'll be back tonight, David. Ugh. Normally, bastard. he would forget these audible experiences. He would question whether they were real or not, whether he was crazy. He generally seems to just be very confused during these moments when he hears these voices. One day, he wakes up with a clear memory of being told that the aliens would be visiting him that night. And on this occasion, he suffers no memory loss. So he spends all day being freaked out, Shit. nervous, and then eventually excited for his date with the aliens. By the evening, David has decided to dress up in a smart tuxedo, ready to receive his visit or abduction with Crescent, the female alien, and the other cast of aliens that travel around with her. And Dr. Mantis. <laughs> he was... So, like, he's waiting around, maybe with, like, a candlelit dinner and <laughs> a row, single rose in a little vase in his apartment. However, no aliens show up. Oh, he gets stood up. <laughs> oh, my God. Ultimate rejection. Oh, my God. Even the alien breeding program is embarrassed <laughs> by you. Oh so he, like, he got changed and he eventually he just gives up. He's like, ah, oh, you know, the aliens aren't coming. I must just be crazy. So then he decides to just take off all his clothes and oh, lie God. on his bed. <laughs> oh, here we go. See, David, they want you natch, man. They want you all natural. Love your curves, David. You don't need to wear makeup, David. Yeah, seriously. You're yeah. just beautiful the way you are. Then, out of nowhere, he notices a black shape or a black hole forming on his bedroom wall. An interplanetary, intergalactic, maybe interdimensional portal. David was suddenly overcome with euphoria. But the, the aliens drive cars, though. Okay. As Crescent, euphoria. the female alien, and the insect alien boss dude... Oh, God. ...enter the apartment you mean the through pimp? the portal. You mean the fucking man is pimp? <laughs> David yes. has... David Huggins has... An intimate encounter oh. with Crescent. And the mantis is just clicking his little claws, like, mm, get to it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But he said he felt so euphoric and relaxed that he didn't feel any fear at all. And he suspects that aliens manipulated him in some way to make him feel relaxed and pleasured. Hmm. David says he has a number of encounters like this. He recalls an incident where he's getting on with Crescent and... All the other aliens, so oh, like the big bug guys and the little hairy guys and the oh mini grey aliens. It's an intergalactic sex ring. <laughs> Probably some other like female aliens are stood around watching, getting like excited. And David turns to them while he's, you know, in the act and says, you know, can we get some privacy guys? And the aliens respect his wishes and go wow. away. But David is aware then that even though they're out of the room, all the aliens are still vicariously Living feeling and accent. experiencing David's bodily sensations oh, wow. and the feelings of what's going on. So it's like all a bit sensei. freaky and yeah. like a shared trip yeah. going on. During another encounter in his apartment, the aliens come into his room through a portal and David requests to enter the portal out of curiosity. He wants to know what's on the other side because it certainly isn't the next door apartment. No. The aliens allow him to go through it and they're all taken to what looks like the inside of a spaceship. Ah. From a window in the spaceship, David can see our planet Earth. Oh. He exclaims, it's so pretty. And the aliens responded, yes, David, something so pretty should be taken care of. Oh, God. So David realises that aliens maybe have a kind of positive yeah. uh, thing going on. These aren't 
so, you know, they're not super bad. They want to keep him. their little sex ring planet going. They're trying oh. to pass on some kind of wisdom to yeah, David. Man. Take care of the planet, David. <laughs> so from this point on, during his encounters, David starts traveling to these alien locations using the portal. Sometimes they're in a spaceship. Sometimes it's underground. You trust him more. In caves, yeah, or in like the side of cliffs. Other times during abductions, David recalls literally floating up high into the sky, like a few thousand feet in the sky at night above New York, into a light beam or a spaceship, along with these little grey aliens, like, holding mm. hands. He basically starts, like, doing it with the female alien in all kinds of different scenarios, like... Oh my god, he's a porn star. <laughs> He is like an intergalactic porn star and he doesn't realize that they use you booze and then once you get too old, they're done with you and then they're going to go find another human to like feature. For their weird niche Earth alien porn. Their niche alien porn. And, and actually, like, oh, no, man, you know what the little like furry dude stuff. is? It's like, it's like what they, they make fun of humans to mm. be. Like tiny little monkey creatures. That, and he is actually just his agent. He's <laughs> the, the star of some very niche alien pornography. Yes. Oh, weird. David moves apartment in New York to the east side. One day, he's in his new apartment when he hears the words, We know where you are, David. Why? Why? Why are you being creepy on purpose? You must know David. You fucked him. You must have known him well enough to see that he doesn't like that. David, so they follow David to his new apartment. <sighs> David becomes, suddenly becomes very emotional. <sighs> And he takes off his clothes and he lays down on his bed to cry. As you do. I always like to cry when I'm naked. Oh yeah, I want to be extra vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, he hears comforting voices saying, Everything is fine, David. Two large female aliens oh. grab him off of his bed naked wow. and force him to the floor. Oh my gosh. One of them is his alien girlfriend, Crescent, Crescent. But she's got a new girl. She asks him what's wrong. And David says to her, My baby died. I dropped it and it died. So David's basically having this like weird... He's got... You'll see this happens a lot. He's, there's a serious thing about babies. Yeah. And he's having some kind of weird episode or breakdown. Basically, he's suddenly got it in his head, now these aliens have turned up, that he has killed a baby or he's got some odd recollection about losing a baby and he kind of has, meeting the aliens at this moment suddenly gives him a breakdown. Okay. I don't know whether this is linked to something in David's yeah, real life, yeah, yeah. like a traumatic experience he had as a little kid where you like lose a baby sibling or something. Yeah. Or if it's some sort of weird psychic knowledge he has about the reason that the aliens are hanging out with yeah. him. Maybe he is part of like a breeding program and that's got into his head. Yeah. There's, there's some sort of baby care happening. Anyway, so Crescent soothes David. She reassures him and says, Your baby didn't die, David. Look, here's your baby. Oh no. And another female alien comes through the portal carrying a hybrid baby. And David goes over to her and he kisses the baby on the forehead. So now it's kind of clear that the encounters David is having with the female aliens are resulting in babies. Hybrid human That might not babies. have even been his baby. They might have just grabbed a baby to reassure him. Who knows where his baby is? It's in the <laughs> mines somewhere. He turns around and realizes that there's a whole bunch of aliens you know around is? him. You know what it is? They're breeding us to fucking work like crazy slaves like somewhere in the galaxy somewhere that, that we can breed certain gases. Yeah. And that's why they're hybriding us make like alien ketchup or like we're all just working <laughs> in like an alien drive through Or alien soap operas. Yeah. So he turns around after kissing this baby on the forehead and having this breakdown in front of all of the aliens. And he realises there's this whole bunch of aliens, like, stood around him, watching him. And he's now... I don't think he's in his apartment anymore. Like, I think they've been transported to some kind of alien place. Anyway, David notices that all of the aliens look shocked and frightened. And realising that he's just had this, like, crazy emotional outburst, talking about killing a baby whilst naked. David says to the aliens, I have something I wish to say to all of you. I'm so sorry that my behaviour scared y'all. Please forgive me. 
And then a few of the female aliens mm -hmm. come over to him and start touching him to reassure David that it's all right. Then they ask the big insect alien boss dude if David can stay. They would like yeah, him girl. to stay. <laughs> but the no. insect says, no, sorry, girls. David has to go back. The alien ladies turn their backs and they walk away from David. And he feels really bad, like he's done something wrong. We can't keep the puppy. He says, excuse me, ladies. I feel like I need to give you a special apology. I'm so sorry about my behavior. If there's anything I can do, just ask. And the female aliens, like, spin around and look at him with funny little smirks and, like, they wink at each other. And then they expose their bosoms okay. and cup them and raise them up okay. in front of David. Okay. David is so shocked by this that he falls onto the floor and the little, it's like an anime. The little hairy guy alien, the little mini Sasquatch, has to come over and actually help David back onto his feet because David was so surprised by what the female aliens are doing, touching their, their boobs and showing him. Now, I just like to point out here, this is the, well, the huge thing for me, is that this guy has been floated thousands of feet up into the sky above New York with little grey aliens. <laughs> he had been to under secret underground caves with spaceships and a cast of weird unknown giant portals. praying mantis creatures and aliens unknown to the rest of humankind. <laughs> he had been into space. He has seen the Earth through the window of an alien spaceship. Yet he is so shocked that an alien got her boob out yeah. that he falls over. Might might have some. It sounds like one of those characters from an anime who has real issues with yeah. women, and through because this is only like, this story is not going to get any better from here. Oh no, okay? it's only going to get worse. Oh no, time. and I feel kind of gross. Like I'm reading some old man's weird sexual fantasy. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, that's what it starts to feel like from here on. So. I'm trying to do it in the most respectable, <laughs> slightly frigid British yes, uh, way. I appreciate it. But there's some stuff that's just too good. So we have to slightly delve into the world of kind of feeling a bit itchy and gross <laughs> listening to this. What sounds very much just like very odd fantasies. So uh, he, he gets picked up to his feet by the mini Sasquatch. Aliens have got a cup in their boobs uh, and showing them to him and like laughing and winking. Mm -hmm. Then one of the female aliens pushing up her bosom okay. with her hand. She comes up to David and they start to make out in front okay. of all the aliens. And that goes on for some time. And I think maybe they dropped... David off home for a little rest and a snack. Must be difficult because they've got very thin lips. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then the next night, the other female alien um, comes over and also makes turn. out with David. Like after he's had like half a day to rest and oh, yeah. eat some like cakes or something. Mm. But if we took it seriously for a second and said that absolutely this was an actual thing that happened, this was all true then this is a very interesting encounter that he has because these encounters, he feels, are somewhat kind of romantic and some of them have a positive element. Sure, he's scared and some of them are kind of negative, especially as a little kid. Yeah. But as an adult, these some of them have a kind of positive element. Like, there's almost a feeling of friendship between David and aliens, whereas other alien abductions might be violent or yeah. frightening or completely forced and no relationship between the aliens and the abductee. David's more, at worst, David's just like a willing sex slave yeah. for an alien breeding program. And there seems to be some sort of like, some mm. relationship between him and the aliens. Anyway, so one time David is having an encounter with the aliens and this female alien <laughs> holding a baby exposes a breast to David. And she does this to express to him that she literally can't express milk, aka yield milk oh. to feed the baby. So David, being the helpful kind of guy that he is, 
says, let me try. Oh, what? And so what? he starts nursing on the alien's breast and stimulating it uh, in various ways to try and get her to create milk. Uh, oh, he's just got the magic touch, hasn't he? It's like the... <laughs> oh, believe me, he has the magic touch. We'll get into that but in, in a short, short while. He is the chosen one. It's to no avail, though, until another alien comes by, sees what David's trying to do, and they place, I think, a bowl of dark food? I don't know if that was right. I was. It was very difficult to pin mm. down what David was talking about. A bowl of dark food and put it on her breast. Suddenly, David feels this, like, pressure on the back of his head, pushing him against his will forward into the alien's boob and he suckled on her breast just like a hungry baby um anyway this works and suddenly the female alien hallelujah is able to create milk and then the actual like hybrid alien baby he learns to feed and it's all thanks to David you and this bowl of this alien that randomly came by and whacked some like you got the power. chocolate <laughs> chocolate spread or something on the alien's boob. The important lesson here, according to David, is that <laughs> David felt not only were the aliens teaching him stuff, but they were learning things from David. Uh. Uh, so one day, David's, he's in his art studio in New York working on a painting when the wall opens up into the portal and he hears Crescent call to him and she comes through the, the portal and says, David, the baby is dying. <sighs> And he's like, whose baby? And she's like, your baby, David. Show me my baby. So Crescent eventually and reluctantly, like, thrusts this hybrid alien human baby at David by, like, the end of its arm. Oh my god, no wonder it's dying. And he says to her, no, don't hold the baby that way. Cradle it like this in your arms. He shows her how to hold the baby properly. Oh, thank God for Thanks, David. David. Thanks for, oh, he's going to do a lot of mansplaining to these aliens. They're just so useless. They're hybrids. Of course they don't know how to take care of a baby. <laughs> he then asks Crescent's permission to come onto the spaceship where their baby is dying or these babies are located. They can't find a female on Earth to show them what... They can intergalactic... They this slightly, this dude they've been getting with is the only person who can help them out. Uh, okay, so he asks Crescent permission to come on board the spaceship, check out this dying baby, and Crescent's like, no, you can't. So David's like, watch this then. And he immediately forces himself to pass out and go unconscious. And then he transports himself to the alien spaceship. So by fainting... And going oh, now David's got six He's learned to like powers. travel, yeah, to the alien spaceship without a portal. So on the spaceships, the usual cast of various comedy aliens. Oh, isn't this such a situation <laughs> that's happening here? Oh, what a what a misunderstanding! It's three's company in here. <laughs> And the boss insect alien asks him, you know, what he's doing there. And David says, I want to see my baby. <laughs> the alien refuses David's request. So David begs on his knees to see his baby, which shocks the aliens. And then the insect aliens immediately like, OK, then follow me. So I can do. Oh, I forgot. I forgot that begging on your knees is a universally accepted symbol of sh yeah of course aliens would be able to understand that so that would sway an alien I just, it, uh, a very human thing that probably isn't even relevant to every culture on, I on just the planet don't understand why they can pick there and are probably choose. other ways to beg pick and choose where aliens are smart they're just picking and choosing oh oh they know that the earth is a beautiful place that needs and to when, be spared when you want a detail a precise detail that might actually verify these claims Suddenly you pass out, but you can't remember it. Or you dunno, like mm. you the aliens wiped your brain. It's very convenient, you know. The it's just annoying that they can not find a and... woman to show them how to hold a baby, yet they've already got hybrids, which suggests that Well it's just Cassie, we just gotta accept that, that you men are a master race on this planet and the aliens that's why I mean look at these aliens, even the women are like Subservient, second rank yeah. to like Mr. Praying Mantis dude. Yeah. 
All right. The hilarious thing about praying mantises is that the female one eats the male. Yeah. So this this guy's got it wrong because he yeah. thinks it's like a male praying mantis in charge. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> okay. So yes, aliens are swayed by his pleading on his knees, <laughs> and they're like, okay, fine then. Like, we'll take you to the babies. They take David to a female alien who is holding a lifeless hybrid alien human baby. <gasps> And oh, even though it's just a story, it's just so horrible. He's if he if it's real or if he's made it up, it's horrible that this is happening. It doesn't matter what yeah. view you take; it's horrifying. There's, there's nothing okay about swinging this. a baby by its legs. One oh one. David, he reaches over and he touches the baby. Oh god! And he feels a stack energy like whoa. And he realises that he actually has some kind of energy power or effect on the baby just through his touch. (laughs) The aliens around him are getting really excited by this. David's magic touch seems to have had a positive effect on these babies. And so the big insect alien takes David into another room filled with hybrid babies. Oh god. Very small babies with pencil thin arms and legs, small chests and large heads and mostly lifeless. The alien gets David to touch all of the babies one well, by they one. They say comfort and contact is very important to to actual baby survival. You know those aliens who just had those babies in clinical like yeah. little grey like test tubes or something. Yeah. So David realises that his touch is very beneficial for the babies. It kind of brings them to life. So he's got them a magic touch, basically. Really? David, which maybe is the reason that the aliens chose him. You yeah. Know? So basically, at this point in the abduction game, it sounds like David's come into terms with the fact that he's part of an alien human breeding program to create hybrid species. But the program isn't very successful. It's not working very well. David believes he's fathered approximately 60 human-alien hybrids, and he's even met these hybrid children at, like, different stages of their life cycles. I was about to say. He's not just seen them as babies, but also as older children, I think. Mm. Okay, so if we go back to the beginning of my story, all these memories come back to David in 1987. Yeah, when he's reading the book. After reading... Chapter that in this lady intruders. mysteriously recommended. Mm. She's like, you look like you could use an alien bark man. Yeah. <laughs> you look like you're a prime target. Or maybe she was the alien. Oh my god. Which I think didn't is, even think about it. That's what they're tempting. suggesting. Oh my yeah. god, that's what they're implying. No! He thinks the aliens were actually behind, you know, him getting this book. That they decided this was good. That they David think, re- yeah. remember his they, they somehow allow him to recall all these memories in 1987 up until then he is he forgets them in his everyday life and he only remembers all of this knowledge about the aliens and can recall and access all his memories when he's with the aliens so what time is what how old is he when he's starting to realize 1987 he's 43 oh god so he's had like you know 30 years of not even realizing of being abducted but he is only able to access the memories during an abduction when he's not being he's not with the aliens he has no memory of it until 1987 it's at this time as well that the aliens suggest that david being an artist paints the aliens and his experiences David was sitting at a table with the aliens one time and one of these tall aliens with this like knob on the back of his head (laughs) said, let David do paintings. David had loads of sleepless nights about it. He was kind of nervous about putting paint paper um, and capturing his memories and, and these aliens. But then he said to hell with it and he worked all day and created his first alien painting and after that, he said he had a great sleep. It was very therapeutic for him to, like, express yeah. these alien abductions he'd had to keep quiet about. Yeah. You know, or that he hadn't been able to remember until now. And so he's continued to paint his alien experiences to this day. He's gained loads of attention for the paintings of his encounters with aliens. He's kind of put paint to paper and very vividly captured his memories he says that each each painting is like a scene from a movie 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna quickly let's have you. You got I'm some a, there. I'm gonna quickly show you some paintings of David Huggins, um, made by David Huggins. All right. Okay, so this is very the very famous one <laughs> of the moment that he loses I his virginity. I thought he was gonna be a good painter, man. This is the encounter in the woods when he's seventeen with the cloak, the alien in the cloak, in a wig. Yeah, and this is David here on on the right. David works I'm in, trying a, not to in a sandwich shop now, but he. Oh, he you paints. mean he didn't take off as a painter? He paints. He didn't take off as a painter with such works and classics as these. He paints, you know, uh, on the side. That one's alright. This is Crescent and him and oh. embracing. There is the bug oh insect in God. the background Just... watching, watching. Oh, the detailing. This the is detailing. one of my favorites, which is. How a very vivid, striking image of Crescent's body. Oh my god! So you can god. see she's got female anatomy from the neck down. Yes, but, but a, an alien. <laughs> and what he believes are wigs, because she's unable to grow hair on right. her head, so she wears this it's like very Cleopatra. specific genetic. I mean, how do you? How can they specifically put a female body and split the genetics such that the body's female and the head's <laughs> alien? But they don't know how to hold a baby. Yeah. They didn't know how to hold their I'm breasts. Not, you don't have to keep showing um, me that picture, guys. Look it up. It's the one where she's holding her boobs. <laughs> there's a lot. There's so many. Um, some of them are quite Graphic. emotional. There's some where he's sort of saying, no, no, oh, um, no, on a medical table with the aliens. They're very vivid. So you should definitely check them out if you're interested in, in having a look. The thing is, I feel for a person like this, because if you even if you feel... Whether it's true or not, that's a horrifying story. And to have to live with that story and believe it's true yeah. and, and you know you've gone through those things, that is a horrifying thing. And, and he is a survivor either way of whatever's happened. Yeah, absolutely. And it, this is not a, a... This is certainly someone with extraordinary life. And yeah. Maybe a very interesting and different perception of yeah. things and understanding of things. So he's since released a book, I think it's called Life in Alien Purgatory, and there's also a really popular documentary that came out that focuses on David Huggins and his paintings and oh, his nice. experiences called Love and Saucers, so you should check that out. Are the aliens still tampering with David Huggins? David's in his 70s now, I think he's like 75, if he's, uh, I hope he's still healthy. Once for all time to um, say Crescent! <laughs> Nothing has happened for a few years. The last time he can remember, David was retouching a damaged painting he had done of a grey alien. And he was thinking to himself, I wonder if they still use these bodies. David falls asleep and he wakes up to find himself amongst the aliens. And they come over in these younger bodies, maybe like more youthful human mm. bodies, and say, David, we have new bodies now. He thinks that aliens... Can I have one, please? Can I play with your youthful bodies, oh, no. aliens? <laughs> he thinks the aliens are still monitoring him and that they listen into his phone calls. David has asked himself the question, why me? Millions of times. He doesn't know why. He says maybe they found him by chance. A lot of uh, other people have speculated that genetically David might be special in some way, and that's why he has been selected for a breeding mm. program with this with these aliens. You know, he's got all this baby advice, Violet. He, they knew they need him to help sort out their ward, their their natal ward. <laughs> he had an exhibition of his alien art alongside the launch of his documentary, the Love and Sources documentary. And the curator of the art institution there met with David and saw the artwork and was quoted as saying, I don't believe that humanoid-like beings from outer space have ever visited Earth. Though the combination of David's sincerity and the visceral impact of his paintings certainly planted at least a seed of possibility in my mind. Yeah. So, you know, you look at the paintings. They are quite, like, dramatic. Oh, this dramatic. Thing, it's not a great... Um, it's not really great paintings, but... They capture a moment. They capture a scene, you know, and for someone to put them out there... Yeah, why not? You know, purely a motivation of this is just what he needs to express. Yeah, that's fine. No other reason. It's quite, you know, 
you can you can appreciate them to yeah. a certain extent. So that's the story of David Huggins. Mr. Huggins, sal- we salute you. You know, you had you had it rough. Yeah. So my immediate thoughts on this are for me like the flaws that come up time and time again in these stories are why do the aliens always have to mimic the abductees? Yeah experience of like human experience yeah. like they're always reflecting things like class systems or genders or appearances more things that are more concerning to things... humans and that we think about without even thinking about yeah. they're not particularly imaginative mm. you know what i mean if if these aliens are imagined they're star they're not... trek aliens with similar human yeah it's like stuff that we can enjoy or understand because it's very human and yeah I... I don't feel that aliens would be... I feel they would have such a different... I can never imagine... When I think alien, I think it's indescribable mm. different. You can't yeah. comprehend. I would have to stare at it for days in order... Months in order to even make out that it exists. Mm. It's so foreign. The way you could argue around it would be to say that this is just the only way our brain can inter- interpret Perhaps, them. yeah. Or that the aliens or holograms. holograms. This has yes. been done... So that we can understand yeah. and not freak out because we wouldn't be able to handle the true essence of what the aliens are actually And maybe are. it is holograms controlled by just really asshole aliens yeah. who don't care. Or we are it's a colony random. of aliens. And we're free roam that have to been placed fuck on with. Earth, and that's why we have similarities to their yeah. way of yeah, existence. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the arguments around that, but... To me, I'm very, it makes me very sceptical when I hear story after story and it's just like, oh, okay, so this is very much a reflection of this guy, particular person's life and culture. Um, <sighs> why aliens gotta be females? The female alien. It's like, again, it's always usually mimics one their, life, one. their understanding of mm. men and women. Yeah, But without all the... Oh, let's cut out all the unnecessary gordy. These females that, are just going to hmm. take you for your semen, yeah. and you're going to have a relationship with them. It's just disappointing them. that this advanced alien race who are so progressive and able to travel around with superior technology and... Haven't figured out equality? Haven't figured out that there isn't a duality of men and yeah. women. That are great, lame. Like, lame. You're, you're no more advanced than we are, right? Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> In fact, we may be the progressive yeah. ones, right now, right? <laughs> But maybe it's just a clever disguise by the aliens to make David feel chill. Maybe there's actually like a beardy man alien behind the mask. Yeah. And they just create this like sexy alien body. Maybe it's all avatars and they're just fucking with us because they are so advanced. They're making us think that, you know, they all find it funny when they do the hologram of the fake baby being dragged Mm -hmm. around and how the human Mm -hmm. reacts to it. Maybe he's just part of a prank show that they don't tell you you're being pranked because it's a long... Truman Show Con. There's so many, you can go in so many directions. And it's this usual lineup of aliens, like, we can't think beyond, ooh, a bug An insect, dude, yeah. The little grey imp It's always dude. like reptile alien. Yeah, or a Sasquatch with glowing eyes. I mean, that's another of those things, it's like when I can deal with Sasquatch to the point of it being an unexplained, uh, undiscovered or unknown to science regular species of animal yeah when sasquatch starts entering supernatural territory when it's like he's a fairy or he's an alien or it's a female sasquatch because we could have gone there there's sexy sasquatch stories let me tell you why oh we can we will be going there (laughs) um it's very convenient when you can say oh well the reason that we've never caught one and never found a skeleton of one and etc and only i can see them is because they're magic Mm. or because they've got and so you know I don't know it's like when you link Sasquatch into the alien story I have reservations let's say that um okay but okay let's just say the aliens are real this is totally true they're abducting David Huggins why are the aliens doing this to him you know is it a breeding program why David Huggins why don't they pick you know, like the some president, peak fitness, oh yeah, athlete, or at least someone interesting, like you know, I don't know, like David Bowie or someone. Like, yeah, like I'm not saying David Huggins isn't interesting in a certain respect, but aliens have a. It's very difficult to understand because no one will believe them. Alien choices, in, but you can say that about anybody. Yeah, 
Maybe it's because they pick people that won't be believed. That's one But they can't figure out how to keep a baby alive. That's the thing. That's mm-hmm. what's really bothering me about the story. That's they the only thing. They created this elaborate breeding program where they David come down needed to this epic swing. technology to steal people like David Huggins <sighs> with memory loss and confusion and or they elaborate just fucking with disguises, him. but they can't do the easy part, which should be just like keeping the babies alive. Yeah, but this is the thing. This is why maybe they're just fucking with them. Maybe that's why they do the creepy voices and why they keep showing up in wigs and stuff. It's just a weird alien prank show. Mm. So why is it, I don't know, the people who seem a bit strange, the people who've got potential kind of mental issues or conditions or different mm. kind of wiring to the rest of us, these are always the people, or very often seem to be the people who've been abducted and had those kind of encounters. Mm. I don't know, if I was going to be a smart alien, you would maybe pick people like that because they wouldn't be believed. Yeah. Or you would cause these kind of behaviours and conditions so that they're not believed by the rest of of the society. Yeah. The thing is about these stories is when people tell a story like this, it's so out there for the average normie that it's just, you have to take it as you will. Yeah. You just have to take it as you will and try not to be too harsh on the people who are living their lives and who claim mm. these experiences because whatever the reason, if it's true, if it's not, blah, 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 mm. blah, it's nicer to be nice to them mm. and to hear their mm. story than to completely dismiss them and be awful. Yeah. If this isn't real, then certain elements of it, I'd say, are kind of just a a sexual fantasy. Yeah. I think a lot of that thing about, you know, a focus on boobs and... Oh, yeah, there's a lot of men being... Red flags. Just uncontrollably forced to, like, get naked and lie down and the aliens are so desperate for them. They just, like, kind of, you know... There's a certain... We all know there's a certain... And they're never ugly aliens. It's never... It's... uh, Tell me if I'm wrong. There might be some ugly-ass alien... uh, sexual assault stories that we're not aware of because we're not Mm. necessarily looking for them but i just it's always very convenient yeah it's always a hot it's always a perfect woman it's always this fancy woman who doesn't poo who has got like this amazing human body yeah with big boobs tall and slim with like a pretty alien face and it's always the uh long hair they're never like a bold gray alien they're wearing a wig yeah Things that, you know, they can... Maybe it is because to do this sort of weird uh, gorilla breeding program... Mm -hmm. They need to make sure that he's going to be attractive. Yeah, they have... Maybe that's part of it. But surely they could create a gel or a medicine to to deal with that, you know. That's why they chose David, because he's not into small tits. He likes them big, Mm. and he likes them separated. That's another thing. In my story, I think Antonio said they were nice and separated as well. Yeah. They like... And and they can push them really up. Mm-hmm. And they're always like gentle and soothing and maternal and touching reassuring and touching him. And Never arguing with him. And being a bit flirty and like winking and smirking like they know something he doesn't and they all desperately want him very badly. And they, but at work? the same time they're slightly obedient and they need to ask the permission of the big man praying mantis alien in the corner of the room because... You know, yeah, that's the kind of. And they need to ask the human man. Aliens are part of. They need to ask the human man how to nurse and yeah. deal with he the has, babies. They need his help. They need his help. So yeah, to me, a lot of it smells of se- creepy sexual fantasy, mm. and it grosses me out uh, when I read it. Now I'm gonna get more deep into a, my analysis of this person. Okay. We have to be really sensitive about the way that we approach this. But I think it is possible that there are kind of repressed memories um, or a trauma at play here. Yeah, we are not psychologists or anything. Yeah. This is very uh, sofa seat analysis. Um, this, this is if this is real. We don't real. have any If this education. is absolutely not real, whether David believes it mm-hmm. or not, if it's not real, you know, possibly things like repressed memories, maybe memories of like an abuse or something mm-hmm. trickle to the surface. Because we know that, like, memories come, you know, they can kind of come, bubble up in a kind of odd, weird way yeah. at certain points in your life. You know, child, childhood memories can be blocked out and they can kind of bubble to yeah. the surface in our adult lives. So maybe it's almost easier for your mind to deal with something like 
you know, a childhood abuse or sexual abuse by kind of interpreting interpreting the scenario differently. Yeah, maybe he lost control deal... because it's an alien, yeah. not because yeah. you know. the the perpetrator are aliens or you know remembering traumas as alien abductions. So that's one, I think, one kind of possibility if we're going to go down that route. And also someone maybe with, you know, we have to include it, someone with some sort of mental health issue or just like, a very well, with the voice perception and wiring. and That could be schizophrenia. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you know, a common thing. In Hearing humans. voices, making kind of strange connections and patterns, a slight feeling of a conspiracy, mm. of being monitored, of... Odd coincidences which need to be explained with a conspiracy theory. And it's in a theory. time period where it wasn't necessarily okay to just mm. go seek... Even if it was real or whatever, yeah. rather than going to... He didn't feel like he could tell a lot of people or whatever. Go, you know, it was a time when you couldn't really see a mental health professional mm. without it being really judgy. Mm. And even to this day, there's still that ripple effect and there's still like this thing... Like, the stigma with it. And, like, mm. maybe if David had at least had someone to talk to, yeah, you know, about these things, you know, they could have helped in some mm. way. It was like David's um, kind of got this thing about babies as mm. part of this. The, the, these hybrid babies and these sort of issues with these hybrid babies would make me think that there's some emotional trauma related to babies in his past. I think from that standpoint, if this isn't a true... If the aliens aren't real, then... I would say that this is someone who has had some, you know, yeah. quite serious mental issues. Certainly someone who's got some odd behaviours and he's got odd ways of perceiving and interpreting yeah. body language. And even in these stories, it kind of seems he has an odd way of yeah. behaving and, and interacting with the aliens. Before, even for a, hu- you know, a human. Yeah. He, he doesn't seem like a... You're an average dude. Yeah. Anyway, the good thing out of all of this, I don't know, if you can call it that, is that David and his like family and friends have said that painting these encounters has been really therapeutic okay. for him. So all you know, all this artwork and getting these aliens out on paper has helped him kind of good. deal with stuff. Channel that energy. So, you know, if you're you got some like stuff that's troubling you get creative try and express it you know write a letter or put it into artwork or if you just have that passion to like bring something to life and capture something yeah. that you can see or feel then yeah it's, it's, it's definitely a good a good bit of art therapy could, yeah could help us all out that's our episode on aliens with a twist of of encounters and mm. such adult encounters adult encounters sexy aliens sexy or creepy i don't know overall it's it, it's just so much to handle <laughs> we're definitely doing another episode at some point but god bless the people who tell these stories mm-hmm. have you got an encounter that happened that you'd like to share with us we promise we won't psychoanalyze you much perhaps you've been up into an egg-shaped alien ship and been given the grand tour. Uh, would you like to email us at worldwearypodcast at gmail.com? Rate us on iTunes. Give us that We're review gonna have and rating. Twitter. We'll have Instagram. Oh, yeah. i got to say, um, I've been really enjoying a, an Instagram story called 1990s Mall Goth. <laughs> um, which basically shares all these photos of like 1990s goths in malls yes. in America and it just really I enjoy it a lot it really resonated with me <laughs> uh, because it's you know I had my mini goth phase when I yeah. was like 12 or 13 I had all my goth friends I just wasn't a good, like I yeah. had goth friends I felt kind of like the outcast of the goths because I wasn't allowed to dye my hair black I couldn't get away with, like, piercings or, like, anything super outrageous. Everyone had the new rock boots with the big, uh, black, like, chunky yeah. golf platform boots. Those. And all the, like, it was all kind of panic at the disco, like, pinstripe black yeah. trousers. You have to be and... rich to be... <laughs> it was a bit emo. Things were going emo oh, when yeah. I was, like, 12. That was, like, emos and... When it was all the Avril emo and... scene. Yeah. Very much like that. Like, the scene goth thing was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like this weird jumble sale goth who had all these like weird black velvet like granny blouses from the <laughs> yeah. charity shop and like weird old black 
tartan skirts and yeah. the Wednesday Adams hairdo and like a little bit of black eyeliner. eyeliner. It was my personality that got me through as a goth yeah. because I was a true goth deep down. But um, it just reminded me of all of those funny moments. You know, we don't have malls here. So our my goth experiences were almost even more lame because it takes the, the deal is it sort of takes a certain bravery to be goth out in the daylight or in the town or like in a shopping mall yeah you know because you look back on it and you're you know i'm a i'm no longer goth (laughs) but you know you're meant to people expect you to be embarrassed when you look back on that yeah and you know yes there have been times that i've been kind of embarrassed to look back on it but the older i get and i'm aware i'm still only in my 20s you know i've got a lot further to go but i'm already feeling at peace with those awkward years. Yeah. You know, I don't regret that phase at all. There's still a piece of that in me. I think the reason that I was even attracted to that kind of goth thing was because there was naturally a shade of that in my personality oh, yeah, anyway. Course. You know, I've said it millions of times, I was like a weird, like, 5'7", Wednesday Adams. It's more about the attitude than the uniform. I hate when, like, everyone has to have a tribal uniform. Mm -hmm. And, like, this is why I always wear t-shirt and jeans. It's taken me a while just to, like, chill out and, like, do all sorts of styles. Because I don't want to be categorized. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So if, if anything, when you break out of that and you just do whatever, it's just... Well, the awesome thing about the Morgoth photos is that what's so like artistic and fun about them is the juxtaposition between the Goths mm. and these like sunny, plasticky, yes. smelly shopping Especially, centers oh with like gosh. old people with shopping bags and stuff. And I remember my, like, lame English version of that (laughs) growing up in, like, a small market town in rural England, Um, you know, which at the time was, like, mainly populated by elderly people. Yeah. And we all, all my friends, we had our first kind of photo shoots in, like, little kiddie playgrounds, like, (laughs) on a swing or, like, posing on top of, like, a baby slide (laughs) or something we were way too big for. And I remember when I was, like, 12, walking around Bath, which is the nearest thing we have to a city, and it's tiny, like, it doesn't really count as a city, and we'd be, like, hanging around on benches outside, like, McDonald's and stuff, and, like, a hot summer's day in our budget goth outfits being kind of self-conscious. And I remember this time these Japanese tourists uh, followed us all around, and they were taking photos of me and my friend from a distance. (sighs) But I realise now it's because I had this bright pink wig on. I had this long, like, uh, fluorescent pink wig and goth clothes. So I was kind of like an OG pastel goth. Yeah, yeah. In, in, when I, you could have been transported in the Harajuki. You would have been just fine. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it really it was brought back some nostalgic memories yeah, for me to, to have a look. So if you like that sort of thing, you should totally check out 1990s mm. more goth. And all our social media is going to be on our website, which will be worldwearypodcast.com, most likely. And yeah, we'll have it all there. Everything will be there. We might even have a Patreon. So if you want to get everything a day early, that'll be the, the, one of the perks there. Make sure you fucking rate and subscribe. I know I've already said that, but it really helps us. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.